when, what, when traveling. And they would only feel safe when they finally returned to the body, to the land, dry, stable land. Bin encompasses that inner satisfaction, pleasure and happiness a person feels when he does the right thing, when everything feels correct and at peace with itself and with everything surrounding it. So, in an Islamic sense, when a person does the right thing, obeys Allah, and worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way He subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship Him, what happens? You have that feeling of satisfaction. You feel secure and happy. Bitter is righteousness. It is acting in a way that invokes that inner peace. It is a firm of set beliefs and actions that will keep your life balanced and safe. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu said, Righteousness is good character. Now, let's move on to the roots of the righteous. What are they? And how do I dig deep to reach them? Is it by attaining sacred knowledge? And is that sufficient? Or is it by having adab? And is that enough? Or is it a mixture of both? Ibn al-Mubarak said, Muhammad ibn Hussein once said to me, we are more in need of acquiring adab than learning hadith. And Imam Zakari al ambali once said, knowledge without adab is like fire without wood, it's dead. And adab without knowledge is like a spirit without a body, also dead, right? Imam Malik ibn Anas, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, said, تَعَلَّمَ الْأَدَبْ قَبْلَ أَن تَتَعَلَّمَ الْعِلْمِ Learn good manners before seeking knowledge. In our old tradition, adab was not taught, but it was rather acquired from interactions between people. And that's why always, you know, we tell parents, you can sit and preach your, to your kids all day long. At the end of the day, they're going to do what you do, not what you say. Because they observe, and then they do what? They imitate you. And Imam Malik said, كانت أمي تعممني وتقول لي اذهب إلى ربيع الراي فتعلم من أدبه قبل علمه. My mother would dress me up in the imam. You guys all know the imam, like have a kufi and then you know wrap the imam on just like to give him the feeling that he's a shape, right? And she'd say, go to Sheikh Rabia and learn from his manners before his knowledge. It was also narrated that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal anhu would have up to 5,000 students at his gatherings. Right? So how many are we tonight about? Maybe what, 100 people? Right? And by tomorrow, inshallah, we'll be what, about 400 maybe? So he would have about 5,000 students in his gatherings. Only 500 would write and learn, while the remaining 4,500 would sit and observe him just to learn from his actions and his essence. Can you imagine? 4,500. Sufyan al Thawri, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, said, كان الرجل إذا أراد أن يكتب الحديث تأبد وتعبد قبل ذلك بعشرين عاما. And this one hits me really hard. If a man intended to write the hadith, if you're going to write hadith and you're going to transmit it, he would study good manners and worship for 20 years before doing so. And subhanAllah, we just like learn to hadith and we're like, okay, we got this, let's get going. We're going to give lectures, right? But we have to think about the act first. And Ibn Mubarak, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, said to the people of Hadith, Antum ila qaneelim min al-adab, ahwaj minkum ila kathirim min al-ilm. You are in greater need of little matters than a great deal of knowledge. And mind you, this was during the golden age, where it was just mostly what? People of knowledge, of fuqaha and scientists. Imagine what they would say if they came to our time right now. The righteous predecessors would learn more from a scholar's manner than they would learn from his علم. And Imam Zuhri, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, said, كُنَّ نَأْتِ الْعَالِمُ فَمَا نَتَعَلَّمْ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ or مِنْ أَدَبِهِ sorry, أَحَبُّ إِلَيْنَا مِنْ عِلْمِهِ We would come to a scholar and what we would learn from his manners was much more dearer to our hearts than what we learned from his knowledge. And Ibn Wahb, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, said, what I learned from the manners of Malik was better than his knowledge. And Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab says something really interesting. He says what? Learn from the 
لمن يعلمكم عند العلم وتواضعوا لمن تعلموه ولا تكونوا جبابرة العلماء فلا يقوم علمكم جهلكم Acquire knowledge and teach people So the first thing when you learn something what do you have to do? Pass it on, right? Even if it was one little thing, pass it on and learn along with the dignity and tranquility don't let your knowledge get to your head and make you become arrogant, right? And humility for those who teach you, and not just that. Humility to those whom you're going to teach after that. Don't again be arrogant. Do not be tyrannical scholars, and thus base your knowledge upon your ignorance. Okay, so now we know what knowledge is, and how important it is to balance it out with Adam. But what is the definition of Adam? Again, it's not fully translatable from Arabic to English, right? But it basically what encompasses all that is good. Anything that is good that a person can do. Or as some translated basically as what? Manners, right? Adab is manners. Adab in Arabic basically means to invite people for food, right? And the word ma'duba in Arabic is derived from the word adab. And it means to invite a lot of people to gather around a table that has lots of food. Therefore, Adam includes all that is good. Now, another question, is Adam, should it be my goal or should it be a means to reach something? Your goal should be Adam. To be able to reach that status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you have to do? You're going to have to work on yourself. And you're going to realize, as you're prepping yourself to reach that goal of Adam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you yourself are changing and you're tra starting to transform into this beautiful soul that is saturated with nothing but adab that is only fit what to meet your creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adab can stem from your heart, a feeling, right? Or it can come from your intellect, something you think about and then you act upon. Or it can come from your subconscious, your inner fitra, natural inclination, right? For example, you were programmed, right? And I hope you guys still do this until now, but we were, you know, I'm much older than you guys. When, you know, when my father would come into the room, I instantly would either stand up or acknowledge his entrance and want to greet him, right? Here, before the heart feels or the mind even thinks what happens, your fitra naturally kind of kicks in, right? Now, the other thing. Is there a difference between adab and akhlaq? Yes, there is. Adab is akhlaq, while manners is morality. Morality and manners actually are, you know, two sides to the same coin. Morality are the akhlaq, or the qualities that reside inside your heart, while manners, or adab, is the outward behavior that people manifest. Okay, again, so akhlaq is what's inside, and adab is what people manifest. In other words, good manners are a result of good morality. So it's basically what you put in your heart is what is going to come out. What you sow is what you reap. And we've all heard about different stories. People who are in coma, right? They listen to a lot of Quran. They didn't memorize the Quran. And what's happening? The brother is doing what? He's studying Quran and on and on. Like he doesn't even, you know, it's just happening because he filled his heart, he filled his soul with the Quran. And vice versa, people trying to see the Shahada and they start doing what? singing or, you know, using bad language, subhanAllah. Whatever goes in is whatever is going to come out. So your huruq translates into your head. Your inner state, guys, has to reflect on your outer state, right? You can't say, well, I look like this, but I'm a good person. No, what's inside has to reflect on what's outside. And akhlaq could be good or bad, right? It could be huruq hasan or huruq sayyid. You could be honest or dishonest. You could be kind or you could be unkind. You could be patient or impatient and so on. But adab, it's really either you have it or you don't, right? You either have the adab or you don't. You can have bad manners, but really you either have adab or you don't have manners, right? And always remember this, it's a very good reminder for all of us. And I remember it was one of the shaykhs mentioned it in one of the conventions I, I attended. And he said, your reaction is a reflection of your own heart. It's not because so-and-so did this or that, no. Your sibling went into your room, right? You guys all have siblings? Yes? No? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. So, or your friend, whatever. And then they touched something they were not supposed to touch and then they broke it. What's gonna happen? 
avoid. <laughs> it's not going to be pretty looking, right? You're going to throw a hissy fit. Like, what? Make you go to the room. I totally don't touch my stuff. Or are you going to start trying to find 70 excuses? Maybe they were curious. Maybe they didn't mean to. Maybe they just bumped into it. Maybe they fell out of their hand, right? SubhanAllah. The way you react will tell you about the state of your heart. Right? And believe me, it's pretty scary because most of the time, we do the first thing. We do what? We throw a hissy fit. Ibn al-Qayyim says in Madarij al-Salikin, the reality of manners is that it results from a beautiful character. Thus, manners are the externalization of the integrity and strength in one's inward disposition into action. And Abu Huraira said that the Messenger of Allah said, of course, we all know this hadith. Verily, I have been sent. You've been sent for what, Ya Rasulullah? Did you just have to pray? To do qiyam? How long our garb should be or how short? No. I was sent to complete what? Good manners. When Aisha radiallahu was asked about Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu she would say, Kana Quran yamshi. He was a walking Quran. And the Dahaq, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, said, As Sayyidul Hasan al Khuluk, the head of the matter is good character. And it has been established from the Prophet and his companions that the transmission of not sacred knowledge but ethical knowledge is an essential objective of the religion of Islam. <laughs> the Sharia in its entirety only creates noble morals. And this one's a really important one. I want you all to really pay attention to this one. Ibn al Qayyim says what? <laughs> the religion itself is entirely good character. So whoever surpasses you in good character has surpassed you in your religion. Wow. I think we all need to ponder upon that one, right? Whoever surpasses us in good character has surpassed us in our religion. We could be praying and fasting and doing qiyam, but then the way we interact with others, the way we respond to our parents or our friends, or the way we carry ourselves as Muslims does not reflect that worship. Right? So now we know that manners is the way we carry ourselves following what certain guidelines that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger have placed for us from Adam. With our parents, to adapt with our siblings, with our neighbors, to the strangers, how we eat, how we visit the sick, and so on. And usually the way the topic of adab is like studied in Islam is divided into four sections, okay? So first we study what adab with who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we move on to adab with who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then adab with the creation, other people, nature, humans, animals, whatever it is. And finally, adab with oneself. And I'm going to touch like very lightly on each of the four because you guys inshallah are going to be going into like real detail in each of the topics with you know the different years inshallah and the guest speakers. So let's first look at the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The utmost level of adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you attribute every action right, of good that you do not to yourself but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favors upon you. If you repent from a sin, you comprehend that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has aided you and guided you to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? ثُمَّ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has repented upon them so that they may repent. If you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a blessing, you know that it's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided you to this thanking. And Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam says what? O oh Lord, how do I thank you while thanking you itself is a blessing that I should thank you for? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? O oh Moses, if you acknowledge that, then you have thanked me. You have to comprehend that every good you do is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon you. The Prophet وسلم, right, used to supplicate every night saying what? Allahumma laka aslamt wa bika amant. And again, when I translate this, it's not going to do it justice. 
O oh Allah, I have submitted to you, and I have believed in you and relied upon you. I am because of you, and I am to you, Ya Allah. And a big wa ilayk. You see the beautiful meaning? We begin with Iyak and Abud, you alone we worship, and we end with wa Iyak and Istain. So you understand that it is Him subhanahu wa ta'ala that has aided you to worship. The reliance is not on oneself. We keep telling each other what? Rely on yourself. Rely on yourself. But is that good advice? How many times has myself or my soul let me down? My true reliance should be on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not talking about tawakkul, where I just sit back and you know, like, oh, Allah will take care of my affairs. No, tawakkul. I do my part and then I leave the rest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the utmost adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, adab with Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I could like spend all night talking to you guys and telling you stories about this, but I know somebody else is covering the topic, so I'll share just one story. I love telling stories, okay? So, this story is about the adab of Sayyidina Ali, but Allah anhu arda with Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the story begins with the battle of Khaybar. And how many Muslim soldiers were there? 1,400 Muslim soldiers, right? And how many Jews or Jew soldiers were there? 10,000. Inside six or seven forts that were on top of hills. So they have a much better position, right? Throwing arrows and whatever. And they have all sorts of supplies, food and water and whatnot that would suffice them for a whole year. For 15 days, the Muslims could not conquer the first fort, right? And on the 13th day, Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, got the shafiqa or migraine that he got from the battle of Uhud when he was hit with what a sword on his helmet. And he couldn't go out. So on the 13th day, what happened? He tells Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, take the banner and go read the Muslims. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq goes out and he comes back up with no one. The second day, Ya Umar, here, take the banner and go. Sayyidina Umar goes out and comes back, but again, no luck. Then Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu says something. He says, لا أعطينا الراية غدا رجلا يفتح الله على يده يحب الله ورسوله ويحبه الله ورسوله Tomorrow, I will give the banner to a man whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause opening to be upon his hands. Listen yes. to this. He loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love him. That night, the camp was on fire. Everybody was like, oh my God, who is it going to be? Could it be me? And every time Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walked between the men, they would like, you know, make themselves appear more, you know, visible. Maybe, you know, Sayyidina Muhammad is going to pick me. Maybe it's me who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger love. And Sayyidina Umar, who never desired anything from this dunya that night, says, well, I never desired for leadership except that night. When that time came, Sayyidina Muhammad gathered everybody and they prayed. And then he asked, where is Ali? So they said, no, so Allah is complaining from his eye. There's something like, he'll pick somebody else from us. He said, no, call him for me. So Sayyidina Ali comes forth. And Sayyidina Muhammad breaks in his hand or blows in his hand. And he starts rubbing on Sayyidina Ali's hand and rubbing on his eye. Until Sayyidina Ali says, Wallahi, I couldn't tell which eye was hurting me. See the gentleness of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells him what? Take the banner, Ya Ali, and do not turn back. La taltafit. Sayyidina Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Ali Sallallahu takes the banner. Listen to this part, this is what I want to talk about. And he got on his horse and he started moving forward. And then as he was leaving, he's like, wait a minute. Like, Sayyidina Muhammad didn't give me detailed instructions. What am I exactly supposed to do, right? But Sayyidina Muhammad said, let us have it. Don't turn back. Look at the adab of Sayyidina Ali. What are you going to do? Instead of turning his horse around, Sayyidina Ali starts backing up with his horse. Right? Look at the adab and the obedience of Prophet Sallallahu But how can a man with your knowledge, Ali, and mentality and status act like that? A lot of people in academia meantime, in the days we live in, do what? If they have that kind of knowledge, they'll refuse to act like that. Like, no, I'm going to turn back and ask, right? But Ali, despite his wisdom, knowledge, and rank, knew what Adam was. He understood what obedience and Adam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's just a little taste of our Adam of Rasulullah sallallahu 
And I'm sure you guys are going to hear much more over the weekend, inshallah. Now, how about at the, the creation? Humans, animals, Muslims, non-Muslims, atheists, plants, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Imam al-Hasan al-Basri summarizes having good manners into three things, right? From which everything else branches out, which covers basically all our daily interactions, right? So what are the three things? The first thing is withholding abuse, right? The second thing is extending kindness. And the third thing, having a cheerful countenance. Simple things. They're not that hard, right? Nobody's asking you to stay up all night. It's great if you do, but these are very simple things to help with other food creation. So let's quickly look at withholding abuse, the first one. Withholding abuse, guys, doesn't necessarily mean physical abuse, right? It could encompass financial abuse, spiritual abuse, and something we can all relate to nowadays, social abuse, right? Ruining other people's reputations, spreading rumors, and social media here plays a huge role. And it plays a huge role in this generation, right, in our time being. All, we can all agree on that, right, social media? And inshallah, we're going to be discussing social media depth on Sunday. So, Abu Musa al-Shari, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him, reported. He said, I asked Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is the most excellent among the Muslims, Ya Rasulullah? He said, one from whose tongue and hands other Muslims are secure. Man salim al-Muslimun min lisani wa yadi. That's the most excellent person, the Muslims. If other people are safe from my tongue and my hands, I become one of the most excellent Muslims. SubhanAllah. And our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the greatest of gatherings in the farewell pilgrimage, Verily, your blood or your lives, your property, your honor, are as sacred and inviolable, sorry, inviolable as the sanctity of this day of yours, in this month of yours, and in this town of yours. Verily, I have conveyed the message to you. I have conveyed the message to you. So when we transgress against others, deceive others, hurt others, and bring them down with our sharp tongues, we are stripping off all the adab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sent down to beautify and protect us and others with. And depending on whom you're transgressing, Against the sin is heavier or lighter in scale. So depending on who has more rights upon you, the sin is heavier or lighter. So for example, if you are transgressing against your parents, it's a hundred times worse than if it's your friend. Or if it's your neighbor, it's worse than a stranger. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu says what? Man kana yu'min billah wal yawm al-akhir fal yakun khayyan hawa. Yes, I use that a lot with my kids, by the way. I have to be kids, so. Like say good or stop arguing, say something good or just halas, just let it be, right? He who believes in Allah and the day of judgment must either say what is good or remain silent. And I read something really beautiful the other day, this uh, Muslim scholar wrote, and it really touched me, I'll read it to you. He says, emotional abuse takes a way longer time to heal from than physical abuse does. So all glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made the kind word in our religion a sadaqah. A kalimat tayyibah is a sadaqah. Because Allah knows the impact of this one word, what it can do for the person in front of you, subhanAllah. Now, the second thing, let's move to it. So the first thing was what withholding abuse. The second thing, extending kindness. Now, extending kindness means what? To be courteous and generous. And not just financially, to give from what's dear and precious to you, right? We always say, what? Oh, somebody needs something? Okay, here, let me donate money. It's like the easiest thing, right? There's no real interaction. You have to give from yourself, from your time, from everything, from your knowledge, something that's dear and precious. All of us know how precious time is, right or wrong, right? And when somebody really needs the help, do you give out of your time and go? Or do you say, okay, I'll just wait, I'll just Venmo you, or what do you guys use here? Hey, Falcon, what do you guys use? Something like we transfer money very easily. Online oh. banking. Online banking. Online banking. There you go. <laughs> All right. Very formal. Online banking. Okay, we use Venmo in America. <laughs> so, assisting those in need. And again, I'm not talking financially. How about emotional needs? 
And I'm talking brothers with brothers, sisters with sisters, don't say sister, you just said emotional assistance, okay? Mm -hmm. Get back to you. And just being there, listening, giving good advice, right? Advice that you would want others to give to you. And just being patient with those who urge towards us. And I'm not talking about people who, you know, misuse or kind of abuse us in a way where they know we're kind so they keep on misusing us, because that's, that's a different story, right? You have to, as a Muslim, you know, hold your ground still, right? Yeah, be kind and be patient, but don't let people take advantage of you. We are in continuous interaction with humans, and you're going to meet the good, just like you're going to meet the ones that are not so good. So always remember this verse when you're dealing with others in the sense of extending kindness. وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا and not equal are the good deed and the bad. Repel the evil by that deed which is better. And thereupon the one who between you and them is enmity, they will become as though they are what? Waliya Hameen, a devoted friend. Can you imagine when someone keeps bothering you, right? and you just smile at them, and then they do it again, and you smile, and they do it again, and you smile. What's going to happen at the end? They're going to feel embarrassed, they're going to get tired, right? They're going to end up like warming up to you, right? And then subhanAllah, Allah says and promises what? They're going to become like a devoted friend, not just a friend, but wali hamim. And Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anhu does says what? لَمْ يَكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَاحِشًا وَلَا مُتَفَاحِشًا وَلَا صَاخِبًا فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ وَلَا يُجْزِئْ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ السَّيِّئَةِ it was not the nature of Rasulullah to talk indecently, nor did he engage himself in the use of obscene language, nor did he shout and talk in the bazaars, which a lot of us do now, and we're so loud and like, ah, and like, like the, the soft voice, right? He did not avenge a bad deed with a bad one, but forgave it, and thereafter did not ever mention it. He doesn't look like, oh, remember that time when you did so something? Come on, I said sorry a hundred times. Yeah, I know. But do you remember when he did so and so to me? We all do that, don't we? We all grudges, subhanAllah. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu never mentioned it after that. Plus, bygoners are bygoners. Now, the third one, and this is an easy one. Having a cheerful countenance. Being pleasant and keeping that smile, right? When you encounter people. Even if you don't feel like smiling. And especially when you don't feel like smiling. There are days when you wake up in the morning and you just don't want anybody to talk to us, right or wrong, we're humans. There are days up and days down. But the days when you don't feel like smiling, you have to push yourself to have the cheerful countenance. When you put in your head that this world does not revolve around you, right? And that other people around you are going through tests and trials, and that they might be having a bad day just like you are, right? They might be stressed about something just like you are. We're going to stop treating those around us like what? Stress balls. You know the stress balls? You guys call them something else here? No, no stress balls. Okay. Mushy things you get like, ah, letting all that out, right? We will stop letting out our frustrations and stress on people that aren't around us. And we'll be able to control that frown on our face and hopefully it'll flip it into it. From here, no, actually the other way. Smile, right? But why? Why is this smile so important? What's so big about smiling? The impact of a smile and having that pleasant demeanor is unbelievable. Allah he can take you to unbelievable lengths. It can open doors to you that you can never ever imagine or would have imagined that they would ever open to you. It can open hearts that were locked with a thousand locks. With it, you can not just enter people's hearts, but their minds. When you smile, people are going to be more willing to listen to you. But if you go with the front on your face, what's going to happen? <laughs> and truthful, oh Ya Rasulullah, when you said what? Don't think little of any good deed, even if it's encountering your brother with a cheerful smile. Sisters, smile. Sisters, brothers, smile. Brothers, and then we're good, right? And his Sahaba or his companion said what? I have never seen a man who smiled as much as the messenger of Allah said. A man who came with such a heavy message being mistreated and being tortured and all that they went through as Muslims and still he was the one who smiled the most. How tough are our trials, you know, compared to Sayyidina Muhammad How bad can it be, right? Being cut off from your family, from your home, right? Your own family going against you, right? His uncle would walk behind him and tell, as he was trying to call people to Islam while he's making tawaf, he'd tell them, he's my nephew, he's crazy, don't listen to him. His own uncle. 
how much worse could it be for us? But yet, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always what? Always smiling. And Sayyidina Amr ibn Abbas has a, like this hadith that I really love. He said, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he gave, or he gave attention and spoke and showed love to the worst person of a nation. So the person may feel he's what? The most important or the most beloved to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, one day I went to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I told him, Ya Rasulullah, who is dearer to you or who is better to you? Me or Abu Bakr? Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Abu Bakr is. So he said, okay, maybe I'm in second place. I'm so special to him the way he treats me. Ya Rasulullah, who is better to you? Me or Sayyidina Umar? He said, Umar. He's like, oh boy, okay. Ya Rasulullah, who is better, me or Uthman? He said, Uthman. He said, okay, I wish I had never asked. He said, I stopped at that, you know, thinking I'm going to probably be at the very, very end of the chain. But that's how Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made everybody around him feel what? So important, just with that smile and giving that extra care and extra attention, right? And I want to share a personal story here with you. And boy, go to Zona. Okay, it's about my hijab, right? So I don't know if some of you guys might have heard this story before, but I do love to share it because it's really, really important. So the first day I wore my hijab, right? And back in the, this I think was 1992. And hijabis back then didn't have the 2,000 different options of hijabs and silk and square and rectangle. It was this big cotton thing. I, I'm serious, it's like a tablecloth. You fold it in half. Big huge triangle, pin it here, and it was a lot of earrings, and there were two colors, I think. There was, I think, beige, white, and I think there was black at some point. And when the gray came out, we were like, woohoo, we got a new color, right? <laughs> so we had sweatpants, we didn't have the idea of skinny, whatever it was, or those, it was like baggy pants, they were like big, huge pants, and the shirts were acne shirts that went down here. So I'm walking down the first day, and I'm feeling like I'm so proud of myself. Like, I did something great. I think I was in, um, I was in high school. And I'm walking, right? And then across the street, there's this sister who's in a kabi. By the way, don't get me wrong, my sister's in a kabi, my best friend's in a kabi, and I love niqabis. But she was dressed in a much more, you know, way that would identify her as a, you know, or we would say more practicing than Muslim, like the black garb and everything, and not, nothing wrong with that, mashallah, may Allah increase her. So she waves at me, and I'm like, oh, okay, she's gonna come and tell me, mashallah, good job. So she crosses the road to me, and then she tells me something, which subhanAllah is about 20 something years later now. I still remember that word. She tells me, inshallah, give me now, you're going to hellfire. So I'm like, what? <laughs> I was like, okay, thank you. And I walked away and I was like, all right. And thank God, thank God. I had my sister back home who was in a copy. And I know what a copy is her life. So I think maybe the sister just got the whole idea of religion and cheerful countenance. Like I could imagine if she had come to me that day and told me, MashaAllah, good job, good girl, whatever, you know, keep going. I would have still remembered her till now. But the words of Allah, my sister told me, don't let people decide for you how you follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidelines and rules. People will be kind, people will be unkind, right? And sometimes, unfortunately, when we get closer, we think we have to be harsher. And that is so wrong. Allah, it's so wrong. It hurts, I'm telling you, I can't remember how many years, 20 something years now, I still remember that word. That was my first encounter, walking down in the hijab on the road, right? So, that was my hijab story. Now, the last point I'm gonna talk about here is what this, uh, the adab with oneself, right? And it usually comes down to what? Taskiyat in nafs, right? Or purification of the soul, or basically following the guidelines of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, what? Set for us. And by following these adab, inshallah, Rabbi, we can reach slowly and steadily the status of a what? Sound heart. Right? The day when they will not benefit anyone but your children. Your children are not going to benefit you. Your wealth is not going to benefit you. Your fame is not. Nothing is going to benefit you except the ones who come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with so quickly, let's recap what we spoke about so far. We spoke about bin and how it is good manners. We spoke about knowledge and how it's of little value, if of nothing, if it's not adorned with what? Adab. We spoke about the meaning of adab and where it can stem from, how it's a goal, not a means. The difference between adab and akhlaq. We said akhlaq is morality, it's what's inside. And matters is what, what we manifest, right? We spoke about how the one who surpasses you in adab surpasses you in religion and the way adab is studied, adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
adab with Rasulullah, adab with creation, and adab with oneself. Now, the final thing I want to wrap up with, inshallah, I don't know how I'm doing on time, I'm okay? Okay, perfect. Is why adab? Why is it so important that we want to spend an entire weekend speaking about adab and delving in its beautiful meanings? Because it's the foundation of our daily life through which we can attain success and an outstanding place in our Muslim and in our non-Muslim community specifically in the day and time we live in. It has to do with our happiness and the happiness of everybody who surrounds us. And it starts with the head of each family. Inshallah, you guys are going to be future moms and dads, right? You guys are the age, inshallah, right? If the father and the mother, they don't possess good manners in dealing with the family, from parents to spouses to children to grandchildren, how can you attain success? How can you be happy and make those around you happy? And what kind of individuals will you be producing to society? Will they be well-balanced individuals? Or will they start the same vicious cycle of unkindness, disrespect, and harshness? This is very important because you are going to be the conveyors of this religion, inshallah. You'll be carrying it on down to the next generations. And believe me, you can preach all day. At the end, the kids are going to copy you. I'm telling you, my kids do this to me all the time. They catch me. I say something and I do something like, well, you said, how come you're doing this? I'm like, because I'm your mom, okay? <laughs> Sayyidina Muhammad sallam, or Sayyidina Ali sorry, when he was asked about the conduct of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his assembly, he replied, Rasulullah was always happy and easy mannered. There was always a smile and a sign of happiness on his blessed face. He was soft natured, and when the people needed his approval, he easily gave consent. We always give people hard times, don't we? Right? No, he easily gave consent. He did not speak in a harsh tone, nor was he stone hearted. He did not scream while speaking nor was he rude or spoke indecently. He did not seek other people's faults. He never overpraised anything, nor exceeded in joking, nor was he a miser. He kept away from undesirable language and did not make as if he did not hear anything. If he did not agree with the next person's wish, he did not make that person feel disheartened. Right, we're like, oh God, really? What a bad idea. Right? Don't we do that? Or the face. So sometimes we don't even say anything. Our face says it all. They're like, okay, right? Nor did he promise anything either to that person. He completely kept himself away from three things. Arguments, <coughs> pride, and senseless utterances. He did not disgrace or insult anyone, nor look for the faults of others. He only spoke that from which tawa and reward was attained. When he spoke, those who were present bowed their heads in such a manner as if birds were sitting on their heads. They did not touch around. What would happen if there's a bird? You just like think of moving and it's going to fly away. They were so still. When he completed his talks, the others would begin speaking. No one would speak when Sayyidina Muhammad spoke. Whenever one wanted to say something, it would be said after and completed after he spoke. They did not argue before him regarding anything. And whenever one spoke to him, the other would be quiet and listen till he would finish. The adab of conversation. And we like it so much. Wallahi, like, I'm not just saying, I'm saying in general, like I teach kids from the age of five till high school. We think it's cool just to interrupt. Well, no, 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 but wait until the person is done and listen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us two ears and one mouth. If he wanted us to talk more than listening, we would have had two mouths over here and one a year over here, right? But we have two years to listen more than we talk, right? The speech of every person was as if the person, the first person was speaking. So he gave the same attention to the first person, just like the last person. Oh, well, is he done? No. Full attention, right? When all people laugh for something, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi would laugh too. The things that surprised people, he would also show surprise regarding that. He would not sit quietly and keep aloof from everyone on his phone. He was there, not a body, but physically, really there in the room. Right? That's the adab of Rasulullah. 
He exercised patience at the harshness and indecent questions of a traveler. Like villagers usually used to ask what irrelevant questions, right? They did not show courtesy and did not have, you know, the etiquette of the Sahaba, right? And they asked like good <coughs> questions. And Sayyidina Muhammad never reprimanded them, right? But exercised patience with them. The Sahaba actually wouldn't bring travelers to his assembly so that they themselves could benefit from the various types of questions asked by these people. And also, here's some questions regarding <coughs> which they themselves, due to etiquette, would not ask. I'm sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi would say, when you see a person in need, then always help that person. If someone praised him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would detest it. If someone by ways of thanks praised him, he would remain silent, right? He did not interrupt someone talking and did not begin speaking when someone else was busy speaking. And if one exceeded the limits, he would stop him or would get up and leave so that the person would stop. That is Rasulullah The final message sent to the final prophet, the seal of all prophets to the entire humanity until the day of judgment was to perfect good character. The fact that you are identified as Muslims obligates you that you have to be different with your pristine mannerisms. The way you interact with others. Every little act you do should be adorned with adab. The way you step up to help someone who's elder. The way you interact with others on your daily commute. The way you speak, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you eat, everything in you should scream out, I am from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu I am a Muslim. And think to yourself, where do you want to be from the beloved Muhammad sallallahu on the day of judgment? And remind yourself of this final hadith that I'm going to leave you with inshallah. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu said, among the most beloved of you to me and the closest to me in sitting on the day of judgment are the best in character. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.